Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In part four of the DSC series, we're going to look at how different heating rates affect thermodynamic and kinetic transitions, which is super important in interpreting your data properly. So, get yourself ready. I, of course, can't have a coffee, but fear not, I shall nip out to a coffee shop once we're done. And let's make a start. We've seen already that the heating rate has a profound effect on the data produced by a DSC. Faster heating rates have the effect of making peaks larger and broader, hence increasing sensitivity, while slower heating rates have the effect of making peaks smaller and narrower, hence increasing resolution. That in itself means you need to choose a heating rate carefully, such that you see all the transitions your sample might be undergoing. And I said it's good practice to run samples at two heating rates, an order of magnitude apart, typically 10, 100 or 20 and 200 degrees centigrade per minute. But heating rates have another impact on DSC data. They affect kinetic and thermodynamic events differently. Because of that, if you have recorded DSC data at two heating rates, then you can determine which events are kinetic and which are thermodynamic, and that really helps with interpretation of your results. But before we get into that, I think I should explain what thermodynamic and kinetic events actually are. To do that, I'm going back to my childhood, when I played a lot with Lego. Actually, I still do, but that's a video for another day. My mother would get me a Lego set from the toy store and I would be super excited to rip open the box and spread the pieces out over the dining table. It took just seconds to make a mess. Then I would spend the day building whatever the kit was meant to be before, at the end of the day, my mother would ask me to put all the pieces back in the box so we could eat dinner. Because I didn't want to do that, I used to leave tidying away to the last minute and would then rush to scoop the pieces back into the box. I usually found they wouldn't all fit. Even though the box was full, I had some left over. What does that have to do with DSC data? I hear you ask. And that's a good question. If you think of the Lego bricks as being individual molecules, things should start to make a lot more sense. When the Lego bricks were put together to make an object, all the bricks were in a particular place and oriented correctly next to their nearest neighbours. This is very similar to how molecules are arranged in a crystalline material. So we can think of the Lego object as a crystalline structure. How quickly can we dismantle our object? Very quickly, if we just knock it over. If we drop our Lego object on the floor from a height, we will find all the pieces separate immediately into a big mess. This is very similar to melting a crystalline material. Although rather than add kinetic energy, falling from a height, we add thermal energy as heat. When there is sufficient energy to break the intermolecular bonds holding the crystal lattice together, the material will melt. Melting occurs at a specific temperature and over a narrow range because a crystalline structure is very organized and all the bonds being broken are the same. So they need the same energy in order to be broken. So melting means giving energy to something to turn it from an ordered structure to a disordered structure. Whenever we make something disordered, the process can happen very fast. Imagine we both had the same Lego model and we both dropped it. For both of us, the model would smash apart immediately. Where the bricks finish up on the floor would of course be different. But because the final state is a disordered state, it doesn't matter. In fact, there are an infinite number of ways in which our final pieces might come to rest. This type of process, ordered to disordered, is called a thermodynamic event. For the process to happen, the sample only needs a certain minimum amount of energy. As soon as it has this, the process will occur immediately. 
Melting is a great example of a thermodynamic event. Imagine now that you have all the Lego pieces on the floor and you want to tidy them away. Imagine also that you want to do that by rebuilding the object that you just smashed. You'd have to pick up the pieces one by one and click them together in a very specific way. Now it does matter where each piece goes and so it takes you some time to build your object and get all the pieces off the floor. This process is very similar to crystallization. The molecules all start in the liquid phase and are moving around in a random fashion. But in order to form a crystal, each molecule must condense onto a growing solid in an exact orientation. And this, as I'm sure you can imagine, takes some time. Sometimes crystals grow quite fast, on the order of seconds to minutes, but other times crystals can take days or weeks to grow. Talk to an organic chemist if you don't believe me. In other words, whenever a process involves going from a disordered state to an ordered state, it takes time. It takes time because now it does matter where each molecule goes, and there is only one final orientation. We call processes like this disordered to ordered kinetic events because they take time. Crystallization and glass transitions, which I shall discuss in a later video, don't worry, are kinetic events. Before we look at how these processes appear in a DSC, let me just summarize. Where a process involves moving from order to disorder, it can happen instantly and it's called a thermodynamic event. And where a process involves moving from disorder to order, it takes time and is called a kinetic event. Knowing this distinction will help a lot when you start interpreting your own DSC data. OK, now let's look at these events in a DSC. These data, which show melting at two different heating rates, are the same as we looked at before. I said that faster heating rates make peaks larger and broader. But did you notice that the onset temperature in each case is exactly the same? Full marks, if you did. But can you think why that would be? I'll give you a few moments to think about that. Hmm. Had a think. The answer is because Melting is a process that involves order to disorder, and so occurs instantly. The only barrier to a sample melting is having sufficient energy to break the bonds holding the crystal lattice together. Once it has that energy, the bonds all break immediately and at the same temperature. Hence, we see the onset of melting at the same point, and we can say that melting transitions are independent of heating rate. In fact, we can extend that and say that all thermodynamic transitions are independent of heating rate in a DSC. It's just that melting is by far the most common type of thermodynamic transition that we see in pharmaceutical solids. Before looking at kinetic events, you might point out to me a couple of things. One is that the peak maximum temperature changes with heating rate, and the other is that the area changes with heating rate. And I would say, Excellent! Very well spotted. I'm glad you're keeping up with the concept. Although the onset temperature of a melting transition is independent of heating rate, the peak maximum will increase as the heating rate gets faster. This is simply because the peak is becoming larger and broader. It is not because the transition itself is occurring at a higher temperature. The area under the curve does indeed get larger, but and we haven't talked about this yet, in order to measure energies correctly, we always need to calibrate our DSC with a suitable reference material. For the types of sample we see in the pharmaceutical world, the reference material is nearly always pure indium, supplied by a suitable standards agency, such as NIST in the US or the Laboratory of the Government Chemist in the UK. When we calibrate our DSC at faster heating rates, the calibration data increase in size as much as the sample data. So our calculated changes in heat work out to be the same. Phew! Now, and I guess this is a leading question, 
What do you think will happen to kinetic events in a DSC at different heating rates? Hmm. Well, if thermodynamic events are independent of heating rate, the chances are that kinetic events are dependent on heating rate. This would be a rather boring video otherwise. Here are two sets of DSC data for the same sample at fast and slow heating rates. I can tell you that the sample was an amorphous glass and that the three events we can see are a glass transition, don't worry about that right now, we will discuss those in a later video, followed by crystallization and then a melt. The melting endotherm appears with the same onset temperature in each experiment, as we would expect, but I hope you can see that the crystallization exotherm appears to occur at a higher temperature at the faster heating rate than at the slower one. Let's think why that might be. At low temperatures, before the crystallization exotherm, the sample is an amorphous solid above its glass transition. Therefore, the molecules are randomly oriented, rather like a viscous liquid. As the temperature is increased, the molecules get more and more energy, so it can move around faster and faster. And eventually, they will be able to move so much they can condense into a crystalline form. The crystalline state is the lowest energy state, and so, relative to the amorphous state it began in, the sample loses energy once crystallized which is why the peak is exothermic. But in a crystalline state, the molecules are completely ordered, with each molecule being in the same alignment with its nearest neighbors. And so the process of crystallizing takes time. Thus, the process of crystallization requires both energy, like melting, and time. In the time it takes for crystallization to occur, the DSC will increase in temperature, the faster the heating rate, the greater the rise in temperature before crystallizing starts. And this is why crystallizing appears at a higher temperature with faster heating rates. As before, we can generalize and say that kinetic events are heating rate dependent in a DSC because kinetic events take time. And in that time, the DSC will increase in temperature. Can you see now why running your sample at at least two different heating rates is important? One reason is because you change sensitivity and resolution, as we talked about already. But another is because if you see events occurring at the same temperature at each heating rate, you know they must be thermodynamic transitions. And if they occur at different temperatures at each heating rate, you know they must be kinetic events. Hence. If you assert that an endotherm in your data reflects your sample melting, you must see it occur at the same temperature when run at a different heating rate. Otherwise, it's not melting. And just to test your new skills, looking at these data again, can you tell me whether the glass transition is a kinetic or a thermodynamic event? It's a... Uh, uh, gotta make a call kinetic event because it appears at a higher temperature at the faster heating rate. We'll discuss why that is in a later video, but well done for testing your new skills on DSC interpretation. For now, just remember to hit the like button and subscribe. Oh no, sorry. Remember that thermodynamic events are heating rate independent and kinetic events are heating rate dependent. That's better. Right, in the next video, we'll look at why we need to pay attention to cooling in a DSC. So hopefully, I will see you there. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.